like using democracy or citing democracy as this kind of like magic ingredient that kickstarts growth, you know, leaves a lot off the table, I think, you know, you know, most of these rich countries are also former or current imperial states, you know, so I mean, empire does help to promote growth, you know. And there is this lack of vision that Jeremy talks about in the book, and it's a point that we've brought up on many occasions about what does the United States and Europe together as the collective West, what do they stand for? And what you hear is, well, we want preservation of the rules-based international order. That's a backwards-looking vision. So, yeah, I mean, we see these huge shifts from Obama to Trump and Trump to Biden, and then perhaps Trump's going to get back in again and swing everything around again. China clearly doesn't have that issue. I mean, we may not like the system it has, but the system it has does give it a lot of stability. Obviously, that's one major priority of the Chinese government has always been to maintain stability or what they call harmony in the society. The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa-China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, and as always, I'm joined by CGSP's managing editor, Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, I've been looking forward to today's show for quite some time. We're going to have a chance to step back from the regular news that we cover and the week-to-week coverage of all the events that are going on, particularly right now in the South China Sea, and issues are also starting to flare back up again between China and India. We're going to have some shows on that coming up in the next few weeks. But today what we want to do is look at the macro systems and this battle for ideas that you and I have been following for more than a decade not only between the United States and China, but also Europe. And then we can start to think about some new players that are coming into the space. The Gulf countries now in places like Africa are becoming much more active. India as well is becoming much more active. From Denmark, the Danes were down in South Africa a couple of weeks ago, and they had a Danish Africa summit. And so there are all of these ideas that are circulating out right now. But the news this week, Kobus, that I'd like to get your take on was the fact that the United States is now committing $4 billion, or let me rephrase that, sorry. The State Department has requested $4 billion in new funding from Congress. And this is the time of year when they do that. They submit their requests for the upcoming budget cycle. $2 billion is going to be earmarked for what they call, quote unquote, game-changing investments to help Indo-Pacific countries to push back against, quote-unquote, predatory efforts. Then there is also $2 billion to create new international infrastructure funds to provide a credible, reliable alternative to Chinese infrastructure funding. Now, that's according to Deputy Secretary of State for Management and Resources, Rich Verma. $4 $4 billion, Cobus, is a whole heck of a lot of money in many contexts, especially dedicated to just one region in, well, it's worldwide, but also $2 billion of that going to just the Indo-Pacific. It comes at a time when there is a lot of discussion in Washington about the need to not only compete, but out-compete China in places like the Global South. This is a topic that has been ignored for quite some time. I was on a number of academic panels this week in Europe, and there is a new level of seriousness in Europe now about the developing world in the global south. And so this brings up a lot of discussion now about how the United States, Europe, and China should be competing for influence, attention, markets, and so forth in places like Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Let me just bring you back, Kobus, to the end of February, when the Atlantic Council ran a uh, a two-day seminar, China in the Global South Development and Influence in a Shifting Global Order. On day two of that event, 
Daniel Twining, who is the president of the International Republican Institute, gave the keynote address. And those of you not familiar with IRI, they are the sister institution to the National Endowment for Democracy. Just those words alone, Cobus, are going to make our listeners in China fume with rage and fury because they all hate the IRI and NED. Nonetheless, the remarks that I want to play for you will really set the tone for our discussion today about looking at the competing systems. And I'd like to get your take on what Daniel had to say in terms of what he feels is the advantages that the United States and democracies have against China in the competition for influence in the global south. I would just like to maybe make some framing comments just to situate things, I think, in a wider lens. And some of these, I think, are home truths that uh, we perhaps have forgotten in our haste to announce uh, a new rising superpower or our I think perhaps sometimes undisciplined belief in kind of a purely new multipolar world. So uh, let me start uh, by really taking on quite directly the proposition that China possesses uh, some kind of alternative and superior model of development. Uh, China, in fact, is following in the footsteps of the Asian tigers, Japan, Korea, Singapore, uh, the city of Hong Kong when it was autonomous. Uh, it is pursuing a similar development strategy, except that because of the political rigidities of the Chinese system, China is now stuck at only between a third and a quarter of those other uh, miracle growth stories uh, per capita GDPs, right? Japan four times richer, Korea and Taiwan over three times richer, etc. Other East Asian economies broke through to high income status only when uh, rapid economic development created large middle classes that demanded political rights and the rule of law to protect their property. That, of course, has not happened in China. The fact is, globally, the only high income societies on earth that do not sit on a bed of oil or gas are open societies with the rule of law. Uh, I think we forget this sometimes. There is no modern day example of successful authoritarian development on par with that of the democracies that produces a high income society. That does not exist, again, outside of a few micro states and Gulf petro states. Uh, economically, we know that democracies actually outperform autocracies for all the messiness and imperfection of democratic systems. Uh, the citizens of democracies are on average six times richer than the citizens uh, of autocracies. Uh, we know, uh, look at the Korean Peninsula, that the driver is not culture or geography, it's politics and institutions, right? Uh, compare South Korea and North Korea. The Atlantic Council's uh, excellent team that produces the Freedom and Prosperity Index reports that 66% of the variation in prosperity around the world can be explained by freedom, freedom. This makes sense, of course. Property rights, the rule of law, effective and sound institutions, secure capital and investment, promote entrepreneurial aspiration, and generate inclusive growth with minimal corruption. Money follows. The world is not multipolar uh, economically in a way that I think it's sometimes presumed. 70% of the total value uh, of global stock market capitalization, 70% resides in the United States. Democracies produce nearly three quarters of global GDP. An astounding 86% of portfolio investment globally, so this is financial flows, comes from the United States and US allied countries with few indicators to suggest that China and its quote allies uh, in places like North Korea or Cambodia are going to follow anytime soon. China is also seen in the developing world in particular as uh, the driver of foreign investment, as, a, as really the decisive source of capital. In fact, the US and Japan are the world's largest sources of outbound investment. According to the OECD's most recent numbers, the US invests more than twice as much abroad as China does. Combined, the US and Japan invest more than three times more abroad than China does. So there you have it, Kobus. That's the case for why the US and the West and democracies have a better system for the world. What's your take? There's a lot to unpack there. I think in the first place, the fact that these countries are particularly where when we're talking about East Asian kind of developmental states, the fact that these countries are democracies now 
isn't necessarily the same thing as claiming that democracy caused their success. You know, because most of the East Asian economic tigers were authoritarian. One or single party kind of states, including Japan actually, was a de facto single party state for a long time during the kind of like beginning South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, you know, all of them were illiberal states in different kind of ways during the bulk of their very rapid development. You know, so in that sense, like using democracy or citing democracy as this kind of like magic ingredient that kickstarts growth, you know, leaves a, a lot off the table, I think, you know. So kind of hearing the perspective, you, you know, it strikes me more as a kind of a set of narratives, you know, kind of which, which is kind of woven together through, you know, certain facts, but leaving out some others. So it, it strikes me more as a story that the West is telling, you know, but it's a very complicated story because it comes from the West. Because the one thing, of course, that he leaves off the table is that most of the, you know, kind of most of these of these kind of rich, I mean, with, with the exception of South Korea, is that, you know, most of these rich countries are also former or current imperial states, you know. So, I mean, empire does help to promote growth, you know. So there's a lot that's not being said there, I think. You're messing up the narrative, Kobus. That is not supposed to be part of the narrative. There is a contrarian view of all this out in a new book, Advantage China, Agent of Change in an Era of Global Disruption, is written by Jeremy Garlick, who's an associate professor and director of the Jan Masaryk Center of International Studies at the Prague University of Economics and Business. I just finished the book. It's absolutely fantastic, and I'm just so thrilled to have... Jeremy, on the show for the first time, joining us from Prague. A very good morning to you, Jeremy. Good morning to you, too, and thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. It's really great to have you. We're going to have a really lively discussion about the book and systems and models and politics. Let's just start very broad. You say that the Chinese system, as it relates to engaging with the Global South, contrary to what Daniel Twining was saying at the International Republican Institute, is better optimized, and there are advantages that the Chinese have. It's, in fact, in the title of your book. You lay out a whole number of different advantages, but there were three in particular. Why don't we start our conversation with just the broad overview of what you think are the structural advantages that China has over the United States, Europe, and others in places like Africa, Asia, and the rest of the global south? Well, I think, uh, you know, first of all, obviously China has the advantage of being huge, right? I mean, population of 1.4 billion, a huge GDP. I mean, it's, there's this, the advantage of size. So there's economies of scale there that, you know, that uh, give China a huge advantage to start off with. But I think there, there, are many, there are many other advantages there as well. I mean, we, we have, you know, China identifies itself as part of the global south, right? So it, it's part of this south-south cooperation dialogue, which I think is a, a key aspect of uh, the image they're putting forward to try to attract the, the global south countries. We are one of you, right? We have experienced what you've experienced. We have also been colonized. I mean, we, we've, you know, there's hot colonies in Macau and Hong Kong and the Japanese invaded during the Second World War. So we are one of you. We understand your problems and we understand how you've been exploited because we also feel exploited. So I think in terms of the discourse, you know, China tries to use that as an advantage to, to gain some leverage in the Global South, to gain some fellow feeling with the Global South countries. And I think this does resonate with Global South countries. But to go back to the advantages China has, apart from, apart from its size, I think also there's the uh, use of infrastructure, the use of investment capital, use of loans that China has, you know, so many construction companies, it actually has a surplus of construction companies, there's overcapacity in China. So China's there looking to utilize these companies to go out and expand the Chinese economy. Obviously, as we know, the Chinese economy is slowing down. I mean, we still see growth in China, but it's slowing down from, you know, previously 10, roughly 10% down to about 4% GDP growth. And as we see the demographic issues hitting in China with the, the population aging and the younger population is, is, is insufficient to sustain the older population. Obviously, the economy is going to contract further. So China needs to get out in the world and uh, you know, expand its economic opportunities elsewhere. And I think what China sees is that there are opportunities in the global south, which I think the West, or particularly we here in Europe, don't really view the global south in this way. It's just you know, countries in Africa, for example, we just view them as requiring assistance, requiring aid, requiring charity from us. And in fact, the Chinese don't view it that way. They see them as potential markets that they can build up and invest in. 
And so the construction companies are part of that, you know, offering infrastructure and loans in a kind of systematic way across the whole global south, offering the same kind of packages to every country so that, you know, nobody thinks they're, they're, they're getting more than the other, you know. So I think there are many advantages. Those are just some of the advantages and you can go into more of them. So, Jeremy, you outlined some of China's strengths. How do you see the US and Europe comparing? Like in your book, you heighten both kind of strengths and weaknesses on their side. Like how do those shake out from your perspective? Well, I think the US obviously has, you know, the advantage there is the developed capitalist economy obviously is a huge tool for the US. Democratic system, the capitalist system is highly developed. I mean, the, 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 what everybody points out as the weakness of China is its authoritarian system. And as we heard in the segment at the beginning, I mean, people think that an authoritarian regime, a rigid authoritarian regime cannot possibly be as flexible, cannot possibly be as... Uh, responsive and cannot achieve such levels of growth, which may be true. Maybe China is stuck in a middle income trap, right? It's possible that might be correct. But I think where China has an advantage is in its ability to not only mobilize its already huge capital due to just to, due to its size economies of scale, but also to mobilize its people. I mean, this is something I look at in the book where we have, you know, the US obviously in many senses is kind of fragmented there's a lot of political disputes, there's a lot of polarization. It's very difficult to achieve consensus as we see, you know, we see this swinging backwards and forwards. Democracy is fine, but if you've got constantly swings backwards and forwards and changes of president and changes of policy, I mean, we see these huge shifts from Obama to Trump and Trump to Biden, and then perhaps Trump's going to get back in again and swing everything around again. So you see this kind of fragmentation, lack of consistency in the American model. China clearly doesn't have that issue. I mean, we may not like the system it has, but the system it has does give it a lot of uh, stability. Obviously, that's one major priority of the Chinese government has always been to maintain stability or what they call harmony in the society. So this gives it a huge advantage of being able to think long term, being able to be consistent over the long term, being able to also to mobilize the people behind, you know, the policies, although people would say that it's it's brainwashing or something like this. But among the Chinese, a lot of Chinese people that I've talked to, I've talked to, you know, Chinese people with different opinions. Not every Chinese person has the same opinion, but a lot of Chinese do really see the benefits the government has brought them, the the the, the economic miracle. They do see their lives especially older people improving from, you know, obviously 30, 40, 50 years ago, huge improvements, huge strides forward, and also a feeling of renewed national pride. This whole, you know, discourse that the Chinese government uses of century of humiliation. We were humiliated in the past. We need to restore our national pride with the China dream. We need to go forward. People, I think, even if they don't like the way the government does things, Chinese people still buy into this and still see progress going forward. And I think this ability of the government to mobilize people behind the China dream, even though I know there is a degree of fragmentation in the society, there's a degree of dissidence and people disagreeing with it. But I think overall, the ability of the government to mobilize the people behind this gives China a huge advantage in being able to achieve what it needs to achieve overseas. And you see this in interviews with construction engineers, say, say working in Montenegro, where he says, I'm proud of being Chinese. I'm proud of what we are achieving here, building this bridge in Montenegro. I'm, it's for China that we're doing this, and I'm proud of doing this. You know, you might try to argue that brainwashing or something, but I think Chinese people, a lot of them do buy into this narrative, and it does give them a, a strength that to come back to the US that the US doesn't have. You're not going to see those kind of narratives coming out of Americans generally, or you're certainly not going to see so much consensus on it. So this ability to sort of mobilize the population, to be able to use companies that it has to do projects overseas, and the ability to be consistent over the long term, although a lot of critics are saying China's inconsistent. I would argue the opposite, that China's very consistent in the way it does things in the global south. I think these give a lot of advantages to China. It's interesting that you talk about that patriotism, because that's an issue that I did want to bring up with you. And one of the things that we've seen in terms of public opinion, 100% correct in talking about how there is a sense, particularly among older generations, about the journey that China's done domestically in their economic development and this appreciation and gratitude both to the government and to the party for doing that. I think that's undeniable by any measure. However, I think the area where I'm going to differ with you a little bit 
is on the perceptions that the Chinese public has about the financial aid and assistance that's been going out as part of the Belt and Road. One of the things that we started noticing after the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summits that happen every three years was that as soon as the announcements were for 20 billion, 40 billion, later 60 billion, Chinese censors went into overdrive to suppress the conversations domestically because there's a growing resentment in China about the amount of money that's going overseas when in fact there is a lot of complaints that there's not enough money spent domestically. And we've seen this in a number of different issues. Remember, there was this school bus, I think they were providing school buses to some Eastern European country, I think it was Romania or somewhere, and people were complaining that saying, why are we giving school buses to Romania when here in Yunnan province and Zhejiang province, our rural populations don't have it? And again, this mobilization of the people, I think, breaks down a little bit when it comes to the money. After the Belt and Road Forum last year, when Xi Jinping announced $100 billion, they came back and backtracked and said most of that money is going to be given domestically, not internationally. And there is a growing sense among many Chinese people, like in the West, where they assume that they're giving away more money than they're actually doing. If you ask a lot of Americans how much of our federal budget is going to international aid and development, they say these ridiculous things like 15%, when in fact it's 0.0001%, one one-thousandth of a percent. We're one of the most miserly governments in the world when it comes to foreign aid. China, too, is not very generous when it comes to foreign aid. And so this mobilization of the public starts to break down when it comes to money. And I'd be interested to get your take on that. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I've also heard that type of opinion expressed even by, I'm not going to say who it was, but somebody very quite prominent expert saying, why are we spending so much money overseas when we need the money at home? Why are we wasting money on the Belt and Road? And I think that's absolutely correct that there's, there's argumentation about that within China. And obviously, we've seen, you know, from a high point of where Belt and Road investments were, were going at a very high level, perhaps a ridiculously high level, around about 2016, 2017, there was a sort of this expansion that was spending on football clubs and all this kind of thing, that we've seen a, a reduction in the spending and a sort of a tightening of the belt in terms of overseas spending, because of what you're saying that the Chinese government doesn't want to give the impression that it's just all the money's going overseas. So we do see a reduction in the spending. But where I think there's still an advantage for China is that the money that there is, and I agree, it's not as much as it was, and it's perhaps not as much as it, you know, you might expect it to be, but it is being spent. And this is where people accuse China of, of building white elephants and things like that and projects that don't work. And I think what they're doing now is spending the money more smartly, you know, directing the money into certain areas which benefit them. For example, you know, obtaining oil supplies. I think this is something that is not talked about enough in the West, but you know China's energy security is something which is very, very keenly important for the government to focus on. I mean, China is a gas producer, but it doesn't produce enough energy to meet its needs, its rising needs. Obviously, as the economy grows, they need more and more energy, and they've needed to import large amounts of oil since about 1994. This is 30 years of, of rising oil imports. So clearly, one of the areas in which China has to focus is getting energy import. So what we see is a pattern of smart spending, smart investments in countries that have you know energy to export such as such as Brazil, which surprised me, you know, that China has focused its investments in Brazil almost entirely in the oil industry, some in soybeans as well. But they've made deals with the between the Chinese state oil company and Brazilian state oil company to obtain those supplies. And Brazil is now supplying about 8% of China's oil, as I, as I understand it. So, so things like this, it's about spending smart, about uh, using the resources you have smartly rather than just spending large amounts of money. Turning from that, I think the other advantage that China, or the other way in which China is moving forward without, as you say, spending too much money is unpopular. So without spending too much money is about sort of building influence in the global south, getting friends or getting allies on side by more ideational means, you know, by attracting them through ideas rather than just through money. I think this is another area that we can look at. 
The critics of China, and particularly those like, for example, in the sound clip we listen to, there is this argument that the fact that China isn't a democracy makes it rigid, that it, it lacks that kind of mechanism that democracy gives to, to kind of move out old ideas and move in new ideas as the population, you know, kind of evolves. But you argue that Chinese officials, uh, you know, through, you know, kind of being immersed in dialectical Marxism and like ancient, like, you know, and, and Chinese history, that that actually provides them a certain amount of dynamism to adapt to changes. I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit and the way that you contrast that to what you call to binary thinking um, in, in the West. Yeah, well, this is to go into sort of, uh, you know, my, my first degree was in philosophy. So I suppose I, I come from that perspective, you know, looking at things like Cartesian dualism, you know, where, where Descartes, I don't want to go too technical, but Descartes basically contrasted body and mind said there's body and mind there's two things they're separate right and whereas you know modern science is finding out that body and mind are closely connected and it's not as separate as we think and then everything is more complex and intertwined and, and my argument in the book is basically that we in the west tend to see everything in terms of categories i mean i hear this all the time because i've lived in you know obviously i'm from europe and i've lived in asia and i've seen that the way people talk, Europeans or Westerners tend to talk in terms of categories, putting things into boxes. This belongs in this box, doesn't belong in that box. I mean, in academia, we have this problem, you know, fields is in this field, but it's not in that field. And, you know, for me, every, a lot of stuff overlaps and I see, you know, this type of thing. And people also talk in terms of, you know, if you, if you believe this, you can't believe that. So it contradicts. If you believe in Marxism, you can't also believe in capitalism. They're incompatible. And I, I think my argument here is that the Chinese or, or I think East Asians in general don't see the world in this way. They don't see the world as we do in terms of categories that belong in boxes and in terms of contradictions. They just say, well, there's, there's Marxism and there's capitalism and why can't we put them together? Let's see if it works, right? And for Westerners, this is impossible. Westerners say, well, it can't possibly work. And Chinese government says, well, let's try it and see if, see if we can make it work. And even if it doesn't work perfectly, it works to some, you know, they've made it work to some extent. They've still got a communist party in charge. I mean, obviously, you know, people are not really these days that much interested in Marxist uh, ideology and so on, but they still, you still have a communist party there still trying to promote that sort of collectivist agenda, but at the same time trying to build up free market economics or using those, those other things. So my argument here is that we live in a complex world. It's a complex world full of contradictions. The Chinese have an advantage in that I don't think they see the world in terms of if you have X, you cannot have Y. If you have zero, you cannot have one. You know, it's it's not as binary. It's more flowing, you know, across categories and we can combine different things together. And they, they just don't have, I think, those kind of mental restrictions that would stop them from trying things out. You know, it's it's all about that going back to Deng Xiaoping's maxim, crossing the river by feeling for the stones or however we want to translate it, you know trying things out, seeing if it works, seeing if you can combine these two things together. Maybe it doesn't work, you know, and some things don't work. And when the thing doesn't work, you just drop it and you try something else. And I think we see this repeatedly with China that they're, they're you know, this is where I say Westerners, like, as we heard at the beginning, you know, saying we are more flexible. Chinese are very rigid. I would argue the Chinese, actually, there's a lot of flexibility in there. And with the something like the Belt and Road Initiative, People accuse it of being vague, accuse it of being imprecise, but I would argue it, it's deliberately designed as a kind of flexible container within which there's a broad direction, there's an overall direction to it, which is consistent, but within it, the detail is flexible. You can shift things around within the model, right? So this is kind of what I'm arguing. Yeah, Kobus, it's very interesting because what Jeremy's saying echoes a little bit what we heard from Kishore Mabubani, who is the... Singaporean diplomat who's become very partisan in his support for the Chinese model. But one of the points that he brought up in one of his recent books was the fact that you look at the U.S. political system and it is so bound by special interests and now by partisan gridlock that it's incapable of actually generating a lot in the way of policy innovation. And so it has a more difficult time responding to policies and to events than the Chinese do as a single party state. And they've been much more adaptable. We certainly see that in the United States, where on the legislative side, they're not very effective at all in terms of generating policies. Jeremy, you bring up the point on this issue of the binary thinking and the zero sum thinking here that this has led to a lack of vision 
regarding the European Union's engagement with the Global South, and then you say the U.S. approach to the Global South is even less defined, and the U.S. doesn't have a coherent approach for development in the Global South, and you go on to say this is not even unique to the Global South, that Europe in particular doesn't even have a coherent, cohesive strategy for China. And so there's just a lot of messiness on the U.S. and European side. Talk about how the binary thinking and what you've laid out in terms of how they see the world in these categories makes it difficult for them, or as you're in your writing, impossible at this point, to have a coherent strategy for the global south. Well, I don't know if I'm arguing that it's impossible. I mean, I'm still trying to be optimistic with this. I mean, I'm living in Europe, so I'm hoping that they, you know, I'm now, I'm now actually in a Horizon Europe project about China. So I hope that we're going to sort of get through to somebody in the European Commission to sort of eventually to sort of rethink this. But I think the problem is that if I focus on Europe specifically, I think Europe, there's a lot of slowness. There's a lot of like institutional slowness, you know, that everything has to be done through these institutional rules and has to be done it through producing documents and things like this. So there's a lot of kind of inbuilt slowness in the systems, which, you know, to come back to China again, you know, and as you were talking about the US, you know, you've got to follow this rule, you've got to, there's got to, budget's got to be decided and all this stuff. I mean, China doesn't have all those kind of restrictions because of its system, because the party runs everything. If they want to make a change, they can just make a change overnight almost, right? They don't have to follow those kind of rules. So the fact that they don't have to follow so many institutional rules gives them a lot of freedom. But to go back to the main point of what you're asking there, the binary thinking, I think in Europe, I mean, as regards to the global south, and the main point of my book was to say that China is winning in the global south, or I've done it winning by gaining advantages, you know, building its influence in the global south. And I think the problem with Europeans on this is that I think they just don't really see, they see the global south, Africa, Latin America, those Asia, they just see those countries as poor, as perpetually poor. They haven't made an adjustment mental adjustment that there is a potential for those countries to grow and that they're already growing and that the, the life is changing there. I mean, there's this sort of fixed image, I think I mentioned in the book, of Africa's needing charity, you know, coming from Band-Aid. We just see the starving Ethiopians, you know, with flies on their faces or whatever. We, this is the image of Africa that's still, I think, prevails in Europe, that we have to help them, that they are poor. And that yeah. hasn't changed at all in the past 20, 30 years. Even amid the Africa rising narrative was on the cover of The Economist. I mean, we haven't seen any evolution in that thinking? I think there's just not enough evolution in that thinking. I think it's just not really changing. I mean, it's still, you know, with the waves of migrants coming into Europe, it's still this idea that they are all poor, they're coming here because they're all starving, and, you know, we just need to help them. There's not really a narrative of you know, I think there needs to be a narrative of we can help that we need to help them, but how can we help them in a way that they want to be helped? That they, that for them as agents, right, giving them agency rather than just seeing them as the passive victims of this, right? Making, the, giving them agency, giving them, talking to them on an equal basis, saying what do you need, what investments do you want? I mean, I think this is where, you know, this is where I'm saying China has an advantage because China just goes into those countries and said they literally just say. They obviously, they just talk to the leaders. They don't talk to the people. They just talk to the elites and they just say, what do you want? What do you need? Oh, do you want a hospital? Do you want a road? Oh, you want a sports stadium? Oh, you want a statue? I mean, you know, they, they, they'll ask for, you know, things that you would probably not think were advisable, but they, they, they go in and they say, well, we're not going to tell you what you should have. We just ask you what you want and we'll see if we can build it for you, right? And we obviously, we want something in return as well, right? Maybe we want a deal for oil or some other resources, but they, they, they're more prepared to go in there and listen to the people there. Obviously, it's the leaders. Obviously, it may not be the best regime that they're dealing with, but they, they're prepared to go in there and treat the countries as, if not equals, at least listening to them. I think the, Europe doesn't really engage with the global south in this way. It doesn't have this, this approach to the global south. It needs to really change its way of thinking. I mean, that's why I say it's binary. I think it's just too much fixed on this old image. You know, Africa is poor. We just have to give them stuff. We have to tell them what they need. We have to tell them that they need to democratize. We have to tell them they need to open up their markets. You know, we're just, te we're just didactically telling them what to do. And the Chinese come in with approach where they say, we're not going to tell you what to do. We're going to listen to you. Or maybe we'll, maybe we'll agree. Maybe we won't, but we'll, we'll engage with you in a dialogue. We're not going to talk down to you. Right. Cobus, pick up on that because this is 
something that we've talked about, about the resentment, the bitter, bitter resentment. And there seems to be no bottom to the reservoir of resentment in many parts of Africa and elsewhere about this attitude that is still what Jeremy says, and, and you and I see it, very prevalent. And they know it. Well, you know, obviously, you know, it's difficult to disentangle contemporary Europe and the US from its past, right? Kind of so all of these interactions are freighted by the past. So it's very difficult for Europe, for example, to just act as, you know, what they are currently, which is a strong global power, and to not have everyone remember that it also used to be an actual colonizer, you know, so those kind of, you know, backgrounds never go away, and they tend to kind of taint whatever is is offered, or the, the kind of interactions that are between those countries and the global north. But Jeremy, at the same time, we're also in a, in a moment where there's a lot of rhetoric, and also some funding, you know, kind of being allocated to a new relationship with Africa and, and with the global south. So, you know, at, at the beginning, Eric was mentioning with these um, funding requests, you know, we're in a moment of the global gateway of, the, you know, the partnership for global infrastructure investment for, you know, Joe Biden saying this, he's all in on Africa. So how successful do you think these efforts are in providing a kind of alternative set of narratives to the one that China is offering? Yeah, a very good question. I, I wanted to pick up on that. I mean, your global gateway, the partnership, the, the PGII yeah. partnership for global investment. I think so far, I mean, those exist mainly at the level of rhetoric. I still don't see that those are as coordinated as they should be, or uh, as clear as clear as they should be. I mean, it's still on the level of rhetoric. I mean, we have to give time. Obviously, they're only uh, you know they've only been introduced in the last two or three or four years. But at the moment, I don't see the coordination there. I mean, that's what I'm arguing in the book that you know China is able to mobilize not just the people but the capital much more easily you know obviously it's state backed so it's it's easier and what europe or the us are talking about is private capital bringing private capital in it's it's just a question of whether they can effectively coordinate that capital so at the moment i don't really see that it's sufficiently coordinated to compete that doesn't mean that it couldn't be this is what i'm saying in the book that it you know there's the opportunity there to compete with china but i think they have to look at what china's doing with a bit more respect and say you know how can we outcompete them? And I think they can outcompete China, but it demands like much more policy coordination, better coordination also between the US and Europe. I mean, we see, you know, especially because of Trump, we sort of saw this complete disconnection of US and Europe. I think there needs to be much better coordination on this. And I think it is possible for them to coordinate and outcompete China if they actually put their minds to it. I wanted to also to talk about, uh, you mentioned the uh, colonialism. I want to just briefly, briefly mention colonialism. I think, you know, there is a, I think it's another thing that's not understood, really not understood well in Europe is the, 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 as you say, the bitterness in many countries about you, the, the history of European colonialism and, and what is seen as, as not sufficient compensation and not sufficient even just acknowledgement of it. And, um, you know, I just, just as an example of this, you, you might think, oh, Europeans know all about this, but as an example of this, I recently right, working on a paper about, about BRICS and I said something about, you know, the, the history of colonialism is important. And we put it for review, an anonymous review comes back that this is a tad British and we Europeans are not really interested in colonialism. We don't think it's very important. It is shocking. I know, it's absolutely shocking. And this reviewer is, I don't know who it is, but it's obviously it's, it's an academic, you know. So if this, uh, you know, th th this is just a British problem or something. I mean, you know, we, we obviously we all know that there's Germany, the Netherlands, you know, even I found even Sweden is, was involved in colonialism. I mean, the whole of Western Europe is really basically affected by this, but it's it's really not been, you know, places like the Netherlands, they're, they're just only just starting to come to terms with it. They're not even, I think, aware of, you know, what they did in Indonesia, for example, Germany, Namibia, they're not really aware of it or they're only, it's only just dawning on them. So that there's a long way to go in thinking about those issues. Yeah, and it's one of those facts that the Chinese are always quick to bring up when they talk to and about the global south. This is something that Xi Jinping just mentioned recently, that we have never colonized another country. We have never invaded another country. We always have to awkwardly remind them about the uh, 1979 invasion of Vietnam, but details, details. <laughs> For the most part, the Chinese then will go on to say, this is what separates us. And again, a lot of people don't also know, particularly in other parts of the global south, that China itself was the victim of the same colonial powers that you talk of. And so that is a bonding mechanism that oftentimes 
brings China together with Global South countries and something very much relevant in the current discourse. And that's something that I think a lot of people in Washington, Brussels, and London don't fully appreciate. Let's let's kind of wind down our discussion here and do a little bit of role playing here. If I am diplomat X from country Y in the, in the US or Europe and say, Jeremy, okay, you've laid out the Chinese advantages. You say we have to coordinate more. That's kind of aspirational in the current environment when tensions between the US and Europe only seem to be going up. And especially if Donald Trump comes back into power, there is the prospect of a major break between the United States and Europe, maybe the end of the NATO alliance. He has called Europe a greater enemy than China is. So I'm not really that optimistic that there's a big appetite in the United States in particular for closer coordination with Europe. I do see the value of it, but I'm not sure it's going to happen. That being said, talk to us a little bit about if I was a U.S. or European diplomat about how to mitigate or to overcome the challenge presented by China in the global south as you've laid out in the book. What would you recommend? I'm glad you asked that because my recommendation would be clear as a you know, been saying already is to diplomats, yeah, to treat. I mean, I'm I'm sure they do this, right? I'm sure they try to do this, but to treat the countries they they're engaging with with respect and listen to what they're saying and actually try to react to what they're saying and and instead of just you know giving the impression that you're talking down to them, that you're telling them what to do, that you know what's best for them, you know, like the 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 sort of elderly uncle being uh, beneficent and standing there saying, you know, this is what you need to do and wagging the finger. I mean, I think in many cases with Westerners, it's not that they, I don't think they're even consciously doing it, but they're kind of unconsciously doing this. They're unconsciously assuming a position of superiority in terms of knowledge, in terms of education, in terms of worldview, in terms of, you know, having democratic institutions and all this kind of stuff. And they, they, they may be not even doing it consciously, but people need to look at themselves and say, you know, how are we being perceived? right? Look at it from the other side's point of view. It's like playing a, a game of chess, where if you're going to play chess well, you need to see, you need to think about what the other player's thinking, right? You're looking at it like, he's going to do this. I need to put myself in his mind. So we, the diplomats need to put themselves in the shoes of the people they're talking to. How are they looking at me? Not just what is best for them from my point of view, but what do they want from me, right? You know, the point being that if you're, if you're going to keep generating negative perceptions by talking down to people, you're not going to get good cooperation from them. If people feel respected, they're more likely to cooperate, they're more likely to come over to you. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of countries in the world that, as I'm saying in the book, are maybe turning towards China, being influenced by China, but a lot of them don't necessarily want to go in with China, then many of them probably would prefer to go in with the West. But if they don't feel respected by the West, or they don't feel you know, the colonial history has been acknowledged sufficiently or they don't feel just being taken seriously, they're not going to cooperate or they're, they're, going to, they're going to go with somebody who they feel gives them a greater degree of respect. And if that's China, then it's China. And if China's also coming in uh, and saying, well, well, we've got this money, we'll invest in this, we'll give you, we'll build you a railway or whatever, then the West is not saying that, then, you know, they'll go with China. But I think there's an opportunity there to just readjust the thinking and readjust the approach. So you make the argument in the book that China, via the Belt and Road Initiative, has emerged as a kind of agent of change in the global south. If you were, you know, to just project yourself forward, a, you know, a decade or three, uh, looking back, what do you think some of the big legacies of the Belt and Road Initiative will be? It's going to be hard to say, but obviously, in its material core, it's like an infrastructure project. So I suppose that with luck, they will actually manage to you know, maintain some of the infrastructure that's been built. Some of it will actually, you know, because past projects, as we know, from the past railway projects in Africa from the 1970s, you know, fell into disrepair or whatever, or were not maintained. To try to, hopefully, some of that will just stay there and expand. I mean, the West never built railways in Africa. China building railways in Africa is, is an innovation. So hopefully things like that, improved energy provision, things like that, Chinese coming in and being the biggest uh, mobile phone operator in Africa. I think you think this is stuff like this I hopefully will remain. But I think looking back 20, 30 years, it's really hard to say, but Belt and Road Initiative might be in the end more about China's influence, whether China's built a network of supporters in the global south, whether China has got the vision to actually help those economies to build up, to put them in a position where they are, you know, rising up towards the level of the global north. I mean, that would 
presumably be the legacy of the Belt and Road Initiative, that it's providing you know, a new vision for the Global South, a new future for the Global South, where the Global South is able to compete with the Global North, or perhaps eventually even overtake the Global North, right? I mean, that seems, seems fantasy at the moment, but th- that it would be rising up to that sort of level. The book is Advantage China, Agent of Change in an Era of Global Disruption, written by Jeremy Garlick, an associate professor and director of the Jan Masaryk Center of International Studies at the Prague University of Economics and Business. And I have good news for everybody. This is a book written by an academic, but not priced at academic book prices. You can actually go out and buy this book on Amazon, get a Kindle for a very affordable rate, and I cannot recommend it enough. It's a wonderful addition to your library understanding about the Chinese engagement in the Global South. And again, in many respects, if you are in the United States or in Europe, this will be a very contrarian perspective. And those of you looking for a little bit of diversity in the thinking about engagement by the Chinese, Europeans, and Americans in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and the rest of the Global South. This is very much worth it. Jeremy, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your insights. Congratulations on the book. Well-deserved. Thank you very much for having me, and I'm, I'm so glad you enjoyed the book. I mean, I'm really happy about that. Kobus, I really hope that people in Washington and Brussels and London take some time to read this book. It is a different point of view, one that does run counter to many of the prevailing narratives, including those that we heard at the beginning of the show from Daniel Twining from the International Republican Institute, where there's just a lack of humility in the U.S. discourse and European discourse about the global south. I still find it shocking that places like Europe are struggling to come to grips with their colonial legacy, but at the same time, we in the United States have not come to grips with our slave history and our own settler colonial history. And let's not forget that the United States has its own colonial history, particularly out here in Asia, where the United States colonized the Philippines and the United States was also present even in China. So there's a lot of history to unpack here, but the lack of humility is, I think, the key thing for me. And I think that the West would be so much more effective in mounting a compelling offer and engagement to the Global South if they had a little more of that humility. I don't expect that to happen, but I think that's what should happen. Yeah, no, I I agree. You know, obviously, greater kind of acknowledgement of the past would be very helpful. I think at the same time, even without humility, even even if, if, if they don't get to the humility place, a certain sense of pragmatism, I think, would be helpful. So, for example, you know, kind of everyone knows that both the US and Europe, because of shrinking birth rates, need more migration, right? So, finding pragmatic ways of simply making that happen without a criminalizing migration completely and without, on the other hand, just simply, you know, kind of like throwing open the doors for chaos is, there seems to be pragmatic ways to make one's way through some of the current processes, but those pragmatic ways are not necessarily being pursued, I think, in these countries. So I think that is one of the things that I think beyond the resentment, the historical resentment and so on, which of course is, is real, I think the bigger issue, I think, in the global South in relation to the current global North is simply just a sense of a lack of possibility, you know, kind of the, or then maybe specifically a sense that both rulers and populations in the global North are refusing to entertain pragmatic solutions, you know, kind of that they would rather kind of hunker down, kind of close everything, you know, that there's there's this kind of zero-sum mindset dominates internal life within those countries, you know, kind of they, they, they dominate domestic life within those countries increasingly, you know, kind of as as US, for example, is facing more and more kind of like stark wealth gaps, for example, with all of the resentments kind of around that, that same kind of zero-sum thinking is also applied to the rest of the world. And so the rest of the world faces a kind of a weird austerity mindset, I think, from the global north. And with that, then there's, there's a feeling like, well, you know, you better engage with China because you're not going to get anything from these other people, you know? So I think they're they're more than even the resentment issue. I think that's one of the big problems. Okay, let's move on from the resentment and the history part. But I think to your point on the pragmatism issue, in order to move forward, you have to have a plan. And there is this lack of vision that Jeremy talks about in the book. And it's a point that we've brought up on many occasions about what does the United States and Europe 
together as the collective West, what do they stand for? And what you hear is, well, we want preservation of the rules-based international order. That's a backwards-looking vision. That's saying to people, we want to preserve what was, not what can be. China rolls up and says, we don't necessarily want to overthrow the rules-based international order. Again, that is a U.S.-constructed narrative. They want to make room for other parts. And so, again, it's not a zero sum. You don't hear the Chinese, and it's very important to listen to the rhetoric, say they want to topple the United States and become the global hegemonic power. That is not part of their discourse. They do want to create more latitude for them to operate within the global order. And that, in the American sense, comes at an expense of their hegemonic power. And that's something that they don't want to give up, particularly institutions like the Atlantic Council are very active in pushing back against any Chinese encroachment on U.S. power. So here's the key question, Kobus. When the Americans come in or the Europeans come in and they say, what's the vision? They don't have one, a forward-looking vision. That's a big problem. The Chinese roll up and they say, We've got the Belt and Road Initiative, we've got the three Gs, that's the Global Civilization Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, and the Global Security Initiative. Right now, those things are all vaporware. They don't really mean anything, but they are a vision. They are something to talk about. Then there's the BRICS, then there's the New Development Bank, then there's the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. The list goes on. Those are all forward-looking initiatives specifically tailored for countries in the global south. That, I think, gives the Chinese an incredible advantage, is the fact that they have some forward-looking talking points, and whereas the talking points for so much of the West are backwards-looking. And that is a big, big challenge. And it's interesting, is that I think that's to a certain extent also true within the West, right? I was actually writing today for, for our newsletter, picking up on, you know, new kind of writing around the US election, where these writers were making the point that on both sides of the US election, like large, both on the MAGA side and on the kind of left side of the Democratic Party, the visions are essentially nostalgic, you know, kind of they're essentially they're kind of looking backwards, like the on the MAGA side to a kind of a made up version of the 1950s, and on the Democratic side to the New Deal and trying to kind of reclaim some of these kind of like advantages that have been lost over time due to ne- neoliberalization in, in the US. So I think that is a kind of a moment we're in in the global north in general, right? Kind of there isn't much kind of like optimistic engagement with the future. There's a lot of gloom about the future. And and then, uh, you know, kind of, uh, and, and as part of that, a lot of kind of popular kind of like, like hearkening back to different kinds of imagined pasts. You know, so China doesn't have any fun past to look back on. China's own past was rough. And so, you know, in many ways, it is more future oriented for that reason. And I think in, in lots of ways, it's in, on the same page as the Global South too, because the Global South has such, in general has such uh, young populations. You know, so so just the, the absence of any kind of articulated future vision, even if it is, as you say, if it's completely vaporware, just simply the fact that there is none of it, come, kind of or very little of it coming out of the US, beyond kind of enclaves within high corporate environments, like kind of futuristic AI or like CRISPR-style gene editing, that kind of stuff, there's a future, kind of a futurity there, but it's it's very much behind the high walls of Google, for example, right? Kind of, it's not it's not shared. It's not a shared future. And so, you know, so, and I think that it, it plays out domestically within Europe and the US, and it also then kind of spreads to the rest of the world. Very interesting. Again, we'll put a link to the book in the show notes to the Kindle. I really, really recommend it. I love doing these author interviews and introducing folks to great new books that are out. We've had a couple author interviews this year. New Sarah Wiwa, her amazing book on the African community in China was another one. So we have a tag on the website called Author Interview. So if you're interested in books, that's what you want to look at. I'm going to be in Turkey this week and very excited to be there for a couple days of seminars. And hopefully I'm going to have a chance to podcast from Istanbul with you, Kobus, so we can talk about what's going on in the Sino-Turkish relationship that touches so many different aspects of the Middle East, the Uyghur issue, Europe relations. I mean, Turkey just is endlessly fascinating for that. So I'm looking forward to that. We're going to do our best to try and make that happen. If that doesn't happen, we'll be back again the week after next with another episode of the show. We want to thank everybody for listening to the show, supporting the China Global South Project, especially our Patreon supporters. 
This would not be possible without you. I cannot tell you how much on behalf of the entire team. We appreciate your ongoing support month after month. Also to our subscribers, your support is critical as well. And we're so happy to be able to serve so many of you with our daily news coverage, our AI chat bot, also our new video series that we're putting out. And we're just about to launch our new research hub, and Cobus has done some excellent writing on the upcoming FOCAC, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summit that's going to take place later this year. So we're going to have that in the research hub that is coming out hopefully in the next few weeks, maybe a month, and so we'll have uh, more information on that. If you would like to get access to all of that, go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe, and we have subscriptions that are very affordable. If you are a student or a teacher, email me, eric at chinaglobalsouth.com, and I will send you links for half-off discounts. Please use your academic email when you contact me. So for Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City. Thank you so much for listening to the China Global South podcast. Both Kobus and I will be back again very soon with another edition. Thanks so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South Project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at ChinaGlobalSouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com. 